America's most important historic routes and roadways are designated as state or national scenic byways because of their unique scenic, historic, and cultural resources. Iconic scenic byways such as Route 66, Blue Ridge Parkway, Lincoln Highway, Pacific Coast Highway, Great River Road, and Lake Superior's stunning North Shore Drive set a standard of what to expect when the traveling public visits a place or drives a route. In Minnesota, the St. Croix Scenic Byway runs along the Minnesota-Wisconsin border and along the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway for 124 miles on a route dating back to 1852, before Minnesota was a state. The United States Congress authorized constructing the Point Douglas to Superior Military Road, as it was called, as a frontier defense route cut into the wilderness for troops stationed at Fort Snelling to provide protection for early settlements along the Mississippi and St. Croix rivers. The 1852 Point Douglas to Superior Military Road through the St. Croix Valley was the first overland route connecting the Mississippi River with Lake Superior. As a result, the importance of the region and the St. Croix Scenic Byway story reaches back in time before statehood, before European explorers, and into a period when the Ojibwa, Dakota, and nine other American Indian tribes once occupied the St. Croix River Valley and the surrounding region. The historic and scenic character of the St. Croix Valley has been a tourist attraction for more than 150 years. By the 1850s, excursion steamboats regularly carried boatloads of people up the St. Croix River to enjoy the spectacular geology and scenery between Stillwater and the navigational headwaters at Taylor's Falls. The St. Croix Scenic Byway is comprised of five historic districts. From the south, the first byway district is called the Stagecoach District. It starts at the junction of the St. Croix and Mississippi Rivers in Point Douglas and continues north along County Highway 21 and then along Stagecoach Trail and Highway 95 through Washington County up to Stillwater. Starting in Stillwater, the byway enters the Sawmill District, which has a very strong historical link to the logging and lumber industry in the second half of the 19th century, and was the location of sawmills from Stillwater upriver through Marine to Taylor's Falls. Marine was the site of the first European settlement in Minnesota and also the site of the first sawmill on the St. Croix River. The Sawmill District transitions into the third district, the Immigrant Trail District in Scandia. This district is at the heart of the immigrant story for our byway and it includes Taylor's Falls as well. Going north from Taylor's Falls along Wild Mountain Road enters into the Nevers Place District. Named after the most dominant structure ever created along the St. Croix River, that structure was Nevers Dam, built across the river in 1890 by lumbermen to control the number of logs in the river at any one time, to backlog water, and make sure that it was possible to float millions of feet of logs through the gates in a regulated way that would prevent log jams farther downstream. Going north from Chisago County into Pine County brings us to the White Pines District. This district was historically in the heart of the dense pine forest, an area of four and a half million acres of white pine trees the largest old growth forest in the Northwest Territory that had been won from the British in the American War of Independence. These examples and many others show that the St. Croix Scenic Byway story is about a region, about communities, both tribal and European, and about migration, immigration, settlement, and the residents who lived and worked along the St. Croix River. This wide ranging heritage story has links back in time over several centuries and carries some of the most enduring cultural traditions right up to the present. The St. Croix Scenic Byway Historical Travel Guide is another of many things developed by this scenic byway organization to bring the St. Croix Valley story to life for visitors and residents alike. When I first heard that the Scenic Byway was looking at uh, coming to this area and designating um, the section of the St. Croix River by our business as a byway, I was very excited. I look at one, um, the historic preservation of our community and what it has to offer, as well as from a business point of view, I think it's 
fantastic to give the, our tourists and any of our guests that want to come to our area an opportunity to have more information. And when I say area, it's very broad, all the way up and down Highway 8 as well as Highway 95 throughout the whole St. Croix Scenic Byway and um, having the state parks as well as the National Scenic Riverway and all that there is to offer. Um, we are so blessed to live here um, and to have what we have to offer here, both for ourselves um, and my family, um, as well as the visitors that want to come see us here. For us, it's important to keep history on the forefront, to honor what we have, to respect our land, and to also learn where communities come from. Our community definitely has a certain personality, and I think sometimes when you think about their history and their ancestry, it helps you understand our area population, and I have to remind myself of that, being of Irish descent. <laughs> um, so I think, I also think the kids need to understand that life hasn't always been like it is now, and I think there'll be a time when they'll honor that more, and as they grow up um, and they honor that, I think they become better citizens and also have a connection to their community and want to see the community thrive and be proud of where they're from. Each district has a unique story that contributes to the opportunity to experience this river region that has been called the birthplace of Minnesota. The St. Croix Byway sometimes hugs the banks of the St. Croix River and at other times traverses blufflands that can rise up 200 feet above the water and suddenly open into six and eight mile vistas along the river. From the earliest days, people wanted to visit. From downtown Stillwater and Hudson, Prescott, Marine on St. Croix, Osceola, Taylors Falls, and St. Croix Falls. And later, when stagecoach routes were opened into Pine County, the cities farther north, Pine City, Hinkley, and Sandstone. I think I've really been impressed with everything that I've seen that the, the Scenic Byway has done by having the St. Croix Scenic Byway and having the website and having that information go out there. I just think that's absolutely valuable to our guests as well as to my business. Several St. Croix Scenic Byway communities were among the first European settlement sites in Minnesota and the stories about these iconic cities, Marine, Stillwater, and Taylors Falls are also the story of how Minnesota was founded. The St. Croix Scenic Byway story begins at a time of culmination of tribal cultures, but hinges on a seminal event. The 1837 Pine Tree Treaty with the Ojibwa and Dakota peoples, which ceded most of the St. Croix Valley to the United States government. Once signed, the treaty served as a pretext for European squatters to take up residence throughout the region the 1837 treaty was followed with the Preemption Act of 1841 that legitimized ownership of lands already taken by settlers, and the 1854 treaty ceded all remaining Ojibwa lands in the deep northern timberlands between the north shore of Lake Superior and the Red River to the United States government. This primed the inevitable course of history to permit rapid changes to the physical environment of the St. Croix Valley that white pine logging would bring, and that activity would erase the wilderness that had defined the region for centuries. The treaty also had the effect of dividing the St. Croix Valley history into two incompatible parts, one looking forward and the other back. The incompatibility was between two different approaches to living and settlement, and the differences would come to write the St. Croix Scenic Byway story and the story of founding Minnesota in a predominantly pan-European vernacular. On April 30th, 1803, the American frontier was formally pushed beyond the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains when Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States, concluded negotiations to purchase 828,000 square miles of land from Napoleon and the nation of France. And this was in a treaty known as the Louisiana Purchase. Although Jefferson effectively doubled the size of the United States, this time not through war, but with the stroke of a pen, he was not without his critics. 
and some members of the United States House and Senate felt that the treaty with France and the resulting land purchase represented an unconstitutional overreach of presidential executive power. At a purchase price of about three cents an acre for all of the French-held lands west of the Mississippi, it was quickly recognized as a breathtaking bargain. Any remaining critics of Jefferson were silenced when the House called for a vote to deny the funding request for purchase that failed by two votes. Had those two votes in the House of Representatives gone the other way, the United States may have remained a much smaller, weaker nation, and only speculation can surmise what it might have taken to later acquire the western half of the United States that defines us today. Underlying opposition to further westward expansion beyond the Appalachians to the Mississippi and now into Louisiana was fear expressed by East Coast business leaders that political power of the Atlantic seaboard states would be threatened by a clash of interests between the new citizens of the West and powerful merchants and bankers of New England. Rich in gold, silver, and other ores, as well as seemingly endless tracts of forest and lands for grazing and farming, the Louisiana land acquisition would come to make America immensely wealthy. Historian Douglas Brinkley concludes that along with the Declaration of Independence and Constitution, the Louisiana Purchase is one of three things that created the modern United States. Post-colonial Americans seized on the promise of opportunities in the newly acquired lands and began a massive migration west. From as far east as New York, from the turkey ridges of the Alleghenies and the Palisades of the Hudson, from the Acadian forest region in Maine and Green Mountains of Vermont, they carried lumber and logging expertise from the great north woods of New Hampshire and Franconia Notch, carried their place names from New England into the western frontier. People breached the Appalachian chain along its entire length to make their way west from the Roanoke Gap in the Blue Ridge from the Shenandoah Valley and Virginia Highlands, all headed west. By the early 1800s, New York had become the great port of entry for immigrants. The Hudson River was the best route heading west. Immigrants arriving from Europe and people choosing to migrate from New England in search of new opportunities on the frontier booked passage on Hudson River sloops to Albany. The trip took three to six days. At Albany, they loaded their possessions in ox carts in summer and on sledges in winter and headed west to Lake Ontario and on to the new lands being opened up for settlement northwest of the Ohio River. Settlers also moved on a web of roads that existed mostly in the east, connecting Atlantic seaboard states. The way farther west had fewer road options. With adoption of the U.S. Constitution in 1789, Congress empowered the federal government to establish post offices and post roads, which was generally interpreted to include all public highways. But at the turn of the 19th century, many post roads, some even near the Atlantic coast, were roads in name only and remained negotiable only on foot and horseback. Only a few roads could handle travel by stagecoach or wagon. Migration West would not be aided by a robust public road system until well into the 19th century. Even as late as 1849, when Minnesota became a territory, the small settlements of St. Paul, St. Anthony, and Stillwater were cut off from population centers in Wisconsin, Illinois, and Iowa by an impenetrable wilderness more than 100 miles wide. Only the Mississippi River broke the barrier. From any direction, waterways were the only transportation option into Minnesota at the time. And of those water options, the Mississippi River was more important than all the rest. In 1804, travel from New York City involved an arduous five to six week journey across 1,000 miles of wilderness to reach the Mississippi River. The few roads that did exist followed roughly along the Ohio River to its confluence with the Mississippi River south of St. Louis. In 1804, St. Louis was the largest town on the frontier. It had been founded 40 years earlier as a fur trading post located on high bluffs along the Mississippi River between its junctions with the Missouri and Ohio rivers. For many Americans, reaching St. Louis represented a difficult first step in their journey into the American frontier. 
They arrived by land and water from the east, but they also came by boat from the south. St. Louis was a hard three-month paddle upriver from New Orleans, 700 miles to the south. Even with the advent of steam power, the journey was not fast or easy. In August 1817, the first steamboat, the Zebulon Pike, reached St. Louis. It had taken the pike 30 days of battling current, sandbars, and snags to reach St. Louis from Natchez, 600 miles to the south, averaging only 20 difficult upstream miles per day. While St. Louis was a final destination for a growing number of people, it was also an intermittent destination for people pouring in from the Atlantic coast who were in transition, some headed farther west, distributing themselves across the American prairie and along the continent's west coast, and some headed upstream into the largely unknown northern forest regions of the upper Mississippi and St. Croix River valleys. The northern forest region of the upper Mississippi and St. Croix had been open to French and then English fur traders for 300 years. And before that, the region, rich in wildlife and foods derived from native plants, had sustained Ojibwa and Dakota peoples. It had been French territory, then British, who ceded the region to the victorious United States following the Revolutionary War. The story of the St. Croix Scenic Byway is a story about migration of both Native Americans and New Englanders from the East Coast, and about European immigration and settlement of the northernmost region of the American frontier, more particularly the St. Croix River Valley. Our story reveals how ethnically diverse populations in the United States and from Europe carved the modern states of Wisconsin and then Minnesota from a forested wilderness that had been home to Ojibwa and Dakota peoples. Conflict and misunderstandings, greed and exploitation, community successes and failures are inevitable parts of the St. Croix Valley story. But so are stories of personal and family achievement in the face of unimaginable challenges. The stories together reveal the complex and exciting achievement of settling the St. Croix Valley and founding Minnesota. Following the War of 1812, the United States built a chain of forts guarding the frontier line between Lake Michigan and the Missouri River and south to Texas. The United States was still wary of the British and whether they might want to appropriate some of the Northwest Territories that were destined to become the states of Minnesota and Wisconsin. Following the Revolutionary War, there were numerous unified actions of tribes to resist white settlement of Indian lands. Ultimately, the War of 1812 shattered attempts at Indian unification and intertribal resistance. Andrew Jackson's ascendancy after the war guaranteed that tribes would lose their lands. As President of the United States, Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act on May 28, 1830, which authorized the President to negotiate with the Southern Indian tribes for their removal to federal territory west of the Mississippi River in exchange for their ancestral homelands. The removal policy would become a preferred solution in other parts of the United States, including territories in the St. Croix and Upper Mississippi River Valleys. Whether tribes had fought with or against the United States in the war, or whether they were loyal to the United States would not matter. Removal from the territory became a preferred solution of many agents who would later negotiate Indian treaties for the United States government. Fort Snelling, built overlooking the junction of the Minnesota and Mississippi Rivers in 1819, took its place in a broad defensive strategy that took account of the possibility of further British aggression, but now focused more heavily on keeping peace in American Indian lands and slowing white encroachment into the territory until treaties permitted it. Along with building Fort Snelling, the United States government established the St. Peter's Indian Agency on the military property at Fort Snelling. Indian agencies were first created to control trade between the United States and American Indian nations. Lawrence Tolliver was appointed Indian agent at Fort Snelling in 1820 and would serve in this position for 19 years. In March 1824, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was created by Congress and perhaps prescient of a dark future to come, 
responsibility for working with American Indian communities was placed under control of the United States War Department. Indian agent Tolliver was responsible for settling disputes between the Dakota and the Ojibwa, who had occupied the territory, and to settle inevitable conflicts between tribes and the people of European descent who would enter the territory. Tolliver was also responsible for delivering annual annuity payments of money to tribes, money that had been promised to tribes in exchange for Indian territory ceded to the United States government in treaties. Now, what is an Indian agent? He represents the government in the area, and his job is to bring policy set by the Indian agency and Congress to the regional area, whatever that is. And then if there has been a treaty, then he's in charge of the annual payments. He also is in charge of um, procuring whatever it is that the government has promised to the Indians. So he has to, if there is, for example, uh, the services of a blacksmith, he has to be sure that blacksmith has the iron, has the coal, has the assistant, has whatever it's going to take to be able to run a smithy so that he can do what was promised in the treaty or wherever the promise came from. In the same way, uh, there would be teachers sometimes hired. There would be, uh, later on, there would be doctors sometimes in the, the promises. Farmers, and I still haven't figured out if the purpose of the farmer is merely to be ag extension agent to teach Indians white man plow style farming, or if his job is also to help provide subsistence, because it seems to go both ways at different times. Um, procuring, procuring draft animals becomes a big issue. If you think about it, you cannot teach plowing unless you have somebody to pull the plow. And so bringing in oxen or horses and then being able to keep them going from year to year, you have to teach all the animal husbandry that goes with it and you have to have the fodder crops that go with it. So it was more complicated than you think to provide those services. But the government kept adding those services into the treaties. So it was obliged to do that, and the Indian agent is supposed to provide it. But in the 1830s, there is out of the old Missouri Territory, Missouri's going to become a state early on, but out of the old Missouri Territory area, there's a man named William Clark. And William Clark, you will know because it's Clark of Lewis and Clark, and he is in charge of the regional area that extends all the way up to Fort Snelling in the 1830s. And William Clark is the man who is over Lawrence Tolliver, who is at the St. Peter's Agency. Now, St. Peter's is the term at that time for the Minnesota River. And so the St. Peter's Agency at one time had been both Ojibwa and Dakota and it covered essentially what is Minnesota today. And as I said, in the late 1820s, that Ojibwa end was taken away from Tolliver, and it was given to the Sault Ste. Marie regional office run by the famous uh, ethnographer, at least in his own mind, the famous ethnographer, uh, Henry Schoolcraft. And so someone living at Leech Lake was expected to bring his problems to Mr. Schoolcraft at Sault Ste. Marie. And all I can say is, in your automobile, that'll take you a while, let alone in canoe and overland. So uh, it wasn't surprising that the Ojibwe continued to go down to Lawrence Tolliver's agency. They were not supposed to come down that far south. Once the Indian agency said, you are northern, you belong to Mr. Schoolcraft, who's at Sault Ste. Marie, you're under his domain. And that, that was said in the late 1820s, that the Ojibwa were no longer under the St. Peter's or the Fort Snelling area Indian agency under Lawrence Tolliver, but instead they reported to Schoolcraft. They were not supposed to come down the Mississippi River, but boy, it's fun to go there. And they, they go there anyhow. The prices are lower at the at that fur trading place, especially when the steamboats begin to bring the goods in. And through the Great Lakes, they were expensive. 
I want to go back to Schoolcraft and Tolliver because okay. they actually had a sort of a war through the Washington office. Each one sent complaints about the other one to Washington. And finally, William Clark, I have found a letter William Clark writes saying, Tolliver is right. We have to get an Ojibwe agent on this end of Lake Superior. They cannot assume that Sault Ste. Marie is going to be where people are going to look. Fort Snelling and the St. Peter's Indian Agency were located south of the informal peace line separating the Dakota and Ojibwa. Having Ojibwa tribal members enter Dakota territory in order to reach an Indian agent presented all sorts of difficulties. Yet Tolliver made the complicated role of Indian agent work as well as could be expected. But the difficult circumstances of maintaining peace with and between the Ojibwa and Dakota, exacerbated by waves of European entering the territory, was not made easier by a United States Congress and War Department that often made it difficult and even impossible for the Indian agent to keep United States promises to the Ojibwa and Dakota peoples. If you think of the deer line that runs through Minnesota and Wisconsin, that roughly is the Ojibwa-Dakota dividing line. When the Ojibwa took over Minnesota and Wisconsin, they drove the Dakota out of that parkland between the heavy wood, wooded areas and the prairies. They, Ojibwa had pushed the Dakota out of a biome that had some really special things in it. One of them is maple groves. One of them is wild rice areas. And one of them is uh, birch bark groves. And those dictate your whole year's activities, which is what's called the seasonal round. So if you start in the spring with um, maple sugaring, you have to have a container and these very lightweight containers made out of birch bark, the muckucks, are fabulous and they're, they're portable, they can be stored once they're and sealed once they're finished. Uh, amazing things, but that, that's not maple syrup, no, that's maple sugar. It has to be hard and um, in order to store and, and travel with it. And then in the summer there's fishing and that would be mostly with nets. And the nets are made by the families. This is what you do in your spare time, is you, you twist either nettle fiber or swamp milkweed fibers. They're in the stems. And you wouldn't use basswood because basswood won't hold it when it's wet. And then you get your bark when the sap is flowing in the spring. And then once you have your bark, then you can make your canoes when you're, you're ready. Um, and in the late summer, then the wild rice is ready. And wild rice is in the natural state. It ripens up the stem. It doesn't ripen so a machine can harvest it, but instead you have to be there when it's ready because it's going to fall. Even a wind can ruin a crop. And so uh, they have to calculate, keep watching, be ready to harvest when it's going to happen. Then there's the fall hunt, and uh, then there is winter fishing on the ice and more winter hunting, and then you're back to uh, spring again and you have the season around. Jumping ahead, way ahead, if the government expects you to be in a certain place and time to receive an annuity because you've signed a treaty, that creates a real hardship in the seasonal round. And the Ojibwa, after they signed the 1837 treaty, and throughout the 1840s and 50s, they always asked their agent, please get that payment moved to the summer. And for reasons that do not make any sense to me, and I've read a lot of Indian agency material, Ojibwa payments were always in the fall. And some of them were as late as that notorious 1850 payment, where they arrived in canoes and went home on snowshoes and uh, a tremendous problem for somebody who has to very carefully calculate the seasonal round. There were a lot of 
moving back and forth from what we know today as Wisconsin into the areas that we know in Minnesota as Ojibwe areas, which are the whole St. Croix. There were villages all along there. There are um, villages over toward what you call Balsam Lake, where the Turtle Lake Band Casino is and all that today. Lots of, of villages in those areas between there and the St. Croix. And then on this side, Chisago is a major route of the Sunrise River area is big deal. And so there were paddle routes those ways or footpaths. And then the Minnesota Fond du Lac, which is essentially West Duluth. That one is where you would, if you were doing the fur trade, you would abandon your big canoe and get in a smaller one. So that's where the American fur had a transshipment site. And that's where there was a, a band of Ojibwa called the Fond du Lac Band. And so if you think about the biomes, Always, they're eating white fish if they're on Lake Superior, and then they're eating buffalo the closer you get to the prairie, and everything in between. Oh, and pemmican, which is pounded buffalo with fat in it. Okay, so Ojibwe country then covers from the Upper Peninsula where there's copper, and that is some of the most desirable of all the resources that the Ojibwe control, uh, all the way out to the Red River, which mostly is a strategic place, and it gets you you can go to Hudson Bay on that if you want. Just because they don't live by each other doesn't mean that they aren't a larger community. In the same way, I believe they go and visit for periods of time. And one of the reasons may be because you need to meet girls or guys. Uh, you will meet someone of a different totem or clan and that you need for the uh, marriage relationships in your community. You, you can't marry too close all the time because you would become ingrown in your uh, bloodlines. And they know that. So they, they have people that they know from other places. We belong to a clan. Uh, our clan is, is the Wolf Clan. And it's much like, I can explain it, much like your last name. It is almost handled the same way. Um, if I have a son and daughter, they are both from the Wolf Clan, because I am. My son will always be from the Wolf Clan. His children will always be from the Wolf Clan. My daughter is from the Wolf Clan. Her children will be from the clan that her husband is. That, that doesn't vary. Uh, myself in particular, uh, we lived, I was, I was born and raised at Balsam Lake. My father was born and raised at Balsam Lake. Uh, his father, Mike, came from Malak originally, Malak Lake, Minnesota, and came to the Balsam Lake area to attend a drum ceremony. He came here, walked from Lake Malak. I mean, you know, walked, took him three days. Uh, he walked and got here to the ceremony, met my grandmother. Uh, her name was Makus, which means little bear. And uh, he made a couple more trips back and forth after that and uh, the walking must have got to him because he decided to stay <laughs> and uh, had, uh, he had seven children. He was looking for somebody not in the wolf clan. So, uh, my, grand, my grandmother was in the, uh, in the mink, the mink clan. Uh, one of the things you don't do is you don't marry somebody within the, the clan. I think I think that's probably why my grandfather hoofed it all the way over here to, to Wisconsin. <laughs> he, he was looking for somebody not in the wolf clan. So. About 600 years ago or more, the Ojibwe people or the Ashinaabe migrated from the East Coast. They migrated from the New York, New Hampshire, uh, main areas along the northeast coast of the United States. That's where the Ashinaabe people came from. There are two stories why they came to this area. One of them involves a very nasty tribe out in the east coast. There was a tribe that did not associate well, they didn't play well with the other tribes <clears throat> and were in the process of wiping out some of those tribes even though they were part of an alliance. But at the time, they think that the Chippewa or the Ashinaabe people also 
were being targeted, and that is why they migrated west along the Great Lakes. The other story is, is that they were told by a prophet or a wise man, a spiritual leader in their tribe, of the coming of the European settlers. <coughs> And his words were that it was not going to be good for the Anishinaabe people and that they should move west along the great waterways to a place where food grows on the water. They did not know what that was or what it meant. But this took a period of hundreds of years. In fact, uh, they said that they, they came part way, they returned, they went back, uh, they did not know for sure where they were going, but eventually <clears throat> found their way through the Great Waterways, what we now know as the Great Lakes, to an area north of Ashland in the Apostle Island chain, and uh, lived on the Great Island, the big island that's called Madeline Island now. I can see why it's a safe place. It's a long ways out to that island, and you couldn't sneak up on anybody out there if you tried, unless you went at midnight without any lights. But they were safe out there because the Lakota people, or the Sioux as they're called now, lived here on the mainland. And the Sioux did not want the Anishinaabe people coming here. They did not like them. They didn't want anything to do with them. And every time they ran into each other, the fight was on. And, and uh, that, that went on for hundreds of years. Eventually, the Anishinaabe people found their way into deeper and deeper into Wisconsin and eventually found what uh, they thought they were looking for at a lake near Solon Springs and that was the wild rice and that is the food that is in that legend or tale that, that grows on the water and that is what they were looking for. So they continued to make forays into Wisconsin uh, constantly battling with the Lakota but anyway, uh, those stories, you know, of the Ojibwe and Anishinaabe people uh, are tied to a lot of things that, you know, happened early, like I said, you know, 600 years, 500 years ago, 400. Uh, our tribe, the St. Croix tribe, as we're known, uh, was called the Lost Tribe for a long time because uh, when the U.S. government was making treaties and trying to, uh, you know, not have big battles up here. They were spread too thin to be fighting every Indian tribe in the nation. So they were <coughs> making treaties with them in order to not have to fight these battles everywhere. Why do we use tobacco? Why do we call it a sema, which means sacred tobacco? It's because we, when we talk to the Creator, or we talk to the higher power, we speak to Him in our language because we say that that's the only language He understands from us. So when we talk to Him, we tell Him that we're going to talk and we offer this tobacco so that it carries, the smoke that it creates by the burning of it carries the words or the prayers that we're going to say up to him. That's the significance <coughs> behind burning or smoking tobacco. The wooden stem of the pipe is for the trees and everything growing on earth. The red bowl symbolizes the flesh and blood of all people. This is the connection between the sky and the earth and the unity of all life. The waters that define the St. Croix Scenic Byway are part of the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway. Together, they provide an exceptional combination of scenic, aesthetic, and recreational values. And for many people, the waters of the St. Croix are symbolic of what connects us all. Now the river for me is, is, is really about the connectivity of communities. Um, because, you know, you, you can be from Hudson, you can be from Stillwater, you can be from St. Croix, you know, it just keeps going. And so it, it allows for us um, a point where we all sort of understand and come from. And uh, we're, we're connected by this waterway, even when we might not feel so. 
and I and I really realized it when we came to live out here. Um, and if you've been to Scandia, you'll know that you know we've just got a couple of things. Uh, we got a pizzeria and a gas station and a bar, and um, so we started to go up and down the river for different things. So Stillwater's our town, Hudson's our town. It goes back and forth on either side. I and mean, we don't sort of delineate between Wisconsin and, and Minnesota. Um, they're all our towns. It's all part of our community. And um, that's become really um, interesting in terms of thinking about travel and issues. Um, it's a way to bring that, you know, it's, a, it's the waterway that brings us all together.